Hello, welcome to part one of how to build your web balloon. Before we begin, let's talk about why building your web balloon is a great idea. One, you learn a lot and there's nothing more rewarding than seeing what you've built become a success. Secondly, building your own web balloon is much more cost effective. Our balloon costs about only $300. Other kits from professional people cost around seven to $800. With that being said, in this episode, we'll be discussing a very important aspect of the project, the tracking system. Now we'll be providing a lot of information, so feel free to skip to the parts you need help with. In this uh, episode, we'll discuss the different types of tracking systems, how our tracking system works, how to build it, and how to use it. We'll also be discussing, <clears throat> uh, we'll also be providing some helpful tips and debug information as well. The tracker we used for this project is called the Traquino. It's basically an Arduino plus a custom shield. Now, if you're not familiar with Arduino, it's basically an open source microcontroller which you can use to build your own projects and circuits. We highly recommend that you check this out. Now let's talk about the different ways to track a balloon. <clears throat> there are three main ways uh, to track a balloon. Satellite tracking, cellular uh, tracking via mobile phone, and APLS tracking. The track we know is an APLS tracker. The first method is cellular tracking. An example of a cellular tracker is a phone with a tracking app installed or a GPS. Cellular trackers pinpoint their exact location by using cellular towers, but according to FCC 22.925, it is illegal to use cellular tracking on a high altitude balloon. So you should definitely not think about using this method for your own high altitude balloon. The second tracking method is satellite tracking. Satellite trackers are reliable, but we didn't use it for two main reasons. One, you have to pay a satellite tracker service provider a monthly or annual fee, just like how you would for your uh, cellular network provider. Secondly, satellite trackers stop updating your position and altitude after about 18,000 meters, which is about 59,000 feet. Most high altitude balloons go way higher than this, including ours. Some balloons even go up to 100,000 feet. We'll discuss altitude optimization in a future video. So basically, by using a satellite tracker, you have to pay an annual monthly subscription fee and your tracker stops updating its position and altitude after 18,000 meters. The third method, and the one that we used, is called the APRS method. APRS stands for the Automatic Packet Reporting System. How this works is the tracker transmits the payload status via the APRS network, and this is picked up by, these transmissions are picked up by special stations called I-gates, which upload the payload status to websites such as APRS.fi. We will go into this in more depth later in the video. Also, different regions have different APRS frequencies. For example, the APRS frequency for North America is 144.390 MHz. Anyways, an APRS tracker with a proper GPS receiver can be utilized to not only transmit altitude, but also position and speed. Perfect for a weather balloon. Now, this tracker may seem amazing, but there is a catch. To legally use this uh, tracker, you must have an amateur radio license, and to obtain this license, you must take a test. But don't worry, I felt the same way, but within two weeks, I learned all the material and was able to pass the test, and I'm not a very good test taker. This book, called the ARRL Ham Radio License Manual, helps you learn a lot of the material and it helps with a lot of other aspects in this project. There's a link to where I got the book in the description, but to help answer the questions on the test, hamstudy.org is the best. There is a link to the website in the description. For an APRS tracker, you only need a technician license, which is the entry-level class. The way the test works is that the 35 questions drawn from a pool of 423 questions. The website I mentioned earlier provides the answer to all 423. You can use the book I mentioned to solidify your understanding of the concepts. If you spend 45 minutes per day studying, you'll be ready in two weeks. When you're ready to take the test, simply search ham radio exams near me and follow the directions. Now that's all taken care of, let's get ready to build the tracker. This tracker involves soldering lots of components onto a custom fabricated PCB. If you're new to soldering, don't worry, I was too. I learned by practicing through a soldering kit. There's a link in the description for the kit I used. Once you, feel once you feel you are comfortable soldering, you are ready to order the parts. So to get the components uh, for your tracker, just go to this website. There's a link in the description below. So once you get to this website, click on the first bullet point. So let's click on that. It'll take us to this Google spreadsheet. And then go down to small surface mount modules. These are basically the components you're going to be soldering onto a PCB. Let's click on that. 
and it takes you to this uh, code with all the components. Uh, this is awesome because you don't have to find the components on your own, they already found it for you, and all you have to do is just order the project. But the only problem is some of these components are not available for purchase, such as this one, and this one, this one, this one, because as you can see, there's zero ships available, so there's none in stock. But this is an easy fix happening to me as well. Just click on this, and we'll open up a page with uh, the specifications and everything. Now let's go back and open this page again. You'll see why in just one moment. Go back and let's click on the same thing we clicked on. This one. And now you have the same page opened up twice, which is great. Just click on this and go down and click Show Similar. And then it opens up all of this, which are basically just the specifications which we want to match with this one to find a component that is compatible and in stock. So let's begin by choosing the brand we want. I went with Yagio, Yagio, I'm not sure how to pronounce it, but this is the one I went with. It was pretty good. So now let's match it with the resistance, just 3.3k ohms. Let's go down. Go to 3.3 k ohms. There we go, 3.3 k ohms. Now let's just jump to voltage rating, and then we'll just get that done. And that is 200 volts. So we'll go down to voltage rating, 200 volts. And as you can see, this goes to 250 milliwatts. This is the one we want to go with, 250 milliwatts. So let's click on that, and then tolerance is one percent. That's great. Let's click on that. So now that you have all of this, just apply them. And it'll take us to this new page, which is great. And it has all the specifications we want. Let's just make sure it's the same. 155, negative 55, 101, 250, 3.3. We can just match that. 200, 155, negative 55, 101, 250, 3.3. So that's great. It's the same thing. And this one is in stock. There's 14 that can ship immediately. So that's great. All you have to do is now just click buy and then click continue shopping. So this is the 17 items including this one, the code we just had. So that's great. Just click continue shopping. And then you can go on to fix the other three components that need fixing such as this one, this one, and this one. So once you fixed all of that, you're good to go. And you'll know you're good to go because when you click this, Let's get that out of the way. This message will uh, go away and then you can proceed to check out. So once you have all this, you're uh, clear to go and you can uh, begin buying your components. And now it's time to go buy the PCB itself. So to get your uh, PCB, simply go back to hab.education and click on the second bullet point. So just click on that. And it'll take you to oshpark.com and these guys they make custom fabricated PCBs, so that's great. You can also click on these diagrams, it'll show you the exact um, pinholes and everything you need to know about the track window, so that's pretty cool. So one all you have to do is click order board and then you're good to go. Uh, besides the as, um, surface mount components and the PCB, you also need to buy this GPS receiver and the transmitter. This is a 144.390 MHz one, and it's used for um, APRS in North America. If you're outside of North America, make sure to buy the radio metrics with the correct megahertz reading for your region. Um, besides this, you also need a GPS receiver to, uh, for your GPS and a antenna. So this antenna is great for testing purposes. It's the one I used. But when you actually send your balloon up into the sky, you should build your own antenna. And stay tuned for that, that will be the next video in this series. So once you get all of this, you're ready to uh, put together your um, tracker and you're uh, good to go. Now it's time to assemble the hardware. All of the components have co codes. For example, one of the three thick film resistors is called R3. This corresponds to the code on the board. All the parts also arrive in individual bags, so it is easy to differentiate between them. Simply place the components on their corresponding locations and solder them. There are many tutorials on YouTube that will teach you how to solder surface mount components with flux, but it takes patience. Some of the components, like ICs, are incredibly small and you have to be slow and patient. Here's a quick build montage of me putting the tracker together.
with us for the rest of the video and that's because he, that he's at his house prototyping and researching for, diff, uh, for new project videos so stay tuned for that so anyways now that we've built the tracker it's time to program it but don't worry you don't have to code numerous lines of code because most of the code is already on github all you have to do is make a few minor changes so to download the track we know code simply go to github and there's a link in the description below for this exact website. So once you get to this website, simply go to clone or download and click on download zip. And it should be downloading it. Then once it's downloaded, go to Arduino the website. Or if you have the latest version of IDE installed on your uh, PC, you can use that as well. But for this tutorial, I'll be using the online Arduino website. Once you get to the website, simply go to software and go to online tools. <clears throat> and then click on Arduino web editor and this will lead you to all the coding editing software stuff so now that you have you can see I already installed Truckwino and this is the one I actually used hence the name but if this is your first time go to import and then it says yeah you can import in .zip which is what the Truckwino file is in so just click import and then you can choose the one you want so that's Truckwino we see 0.527 that's the one we just downloaded so let's upload that one and then click open and it says please wait for your file and it should and it says sketches successfully imported that's great <clears throat> click ok and this is the file you have now your software is pretty much ready to go there's only a couple changes we have to do so click on this and it'll open up all the other files and go to con config.h this is the configuration file and the one which will make changes in. So first change you have to do is it says a my call. This is actually a call sign. This is what you'll be using to input into APLs.fi. So my call sign is K KM6 WSF. So just fill in what your call sign is. And then go down. And then this is all good. This is just the path what your uh, balloon takes. We'll discuss path into more depth later on in this video in this series. <clears throat> and then here's the APLS comment. This is what follows your packet when it comes. So let's just replace this with APLS tracker tutorial video. So you can put whatever you want, like your name, the balloon. <clears throat> And then as you go down, these are all the, these, as you go down, you'll see some debug information. You can enable any of them if you like. So I, <clears throat> in the one I did, let's go check that out. Go to config dot, oops, I went too far down. Go to config dot h. Ah, wait, one second. Config dot h. And then as you go down, see the ones. So I in fact did not <clears throat> enable uh, any of these debugs, and the tracker worked great. So you can do the same, but if you'd like, you can define any of these debugs. So that's it. The code after you do those simple changes on config.h, your code is ready to go, and all you have to do now is upload it. Now that you have your code edited and compiled, it is time to upload it to the Arduino. Before uploading, make sure to remove the Traquino shield from the Arduino. Once your code is uploaded, disconnect the Arduino and then place the Traquino back on top. Before plugging the Arduino back into the computer for power or into a battery pack, it is important to attach the antennas to the GPS receiver and to the APLS transmitter. Not doing so may result in the damage of the component or the entire board. Once all antennas are hooked up and the Arduino is receiving power, the light on the GPS receiver should light up, indicating that it is receiving power. Make sure that the GPS receiver is pushed in fully to ensure full electrical contact, as you can see right here. In a minute or so, you should see the GPS receiver blinking, as you can see here. That indicates that the GPS receiver has locked onto a GPS position. It helps to have your GPS antenna outside, but it also works pretty well inside as well. Having it on top of a metallic surface uh, helps it uh, get to a GPS lo uh, position, lock on a GPS position faster as the metallic surface acts as a ground plane. We'll go more into this concept in the next video. 
Anyways, with your GPS receiver over the metallic surface and the GPS module blinking, the tracker should begin transmitting its position. To see these transmissions, go to APLS.FI. So this is APLS.FI. If you watched the last video, you'd remember that we touched lightly upon this, but in this video will go into a little bit more depth. So right off the bat, when opening up the website, you can see all these tiny icons. These are basically all the stations that are being displayed on the website. So let's click on one of them and go to info. And you can see its last time it updated and its location, its device, the last pad, packet rate, all that cool stuff. Now let's go back. And to track your balloon, uh, simply type the call sign which you set during the config.h uh, file when you are programming the tracker. So I'll put that in km6wsf. Now if you're wondering what this dash 11 is, it's basically the ID given to the uh, tracker that you're uh, tracking. So as you can see here, this oh3gly-9 is represented by this curl. And if you go ahead and click search, you can see that this dash 11 is represented by a balloon because all dash 11s are like spacecraft and stuff like that. So now let's click on info and you can see the comment which we also set in the config.h file and mine says SNA balloon for the first initials of my name and my funded DPS name. And you can also see the location, the last time it updated, its altitude, its coils and speed. And then we come down to this called path. So basically what path is, the path settings basically determine what kind and how many digital repeaters or digipeaters will be used to deliver packets to the destination. Uh, in this case, the destination is an eye gate, which is the one that's updating and uh, putting this data on the internet onto websites like APLS.fi. So you can learn more about paths and digipeaters and all that stuff on the internet or on that ham radio manual we showed you previously in this video. So now let's go back to map view and when your station is on the ground you can click track and street view but because this was in the sky it's not available at this location so try clicking on track and street view when you transmit from the ground and also if you follow this line from the balloon you can see it's actually being picked you can see, actually see the station that's picking up the uh, uh, balloon and this is all the way in Los Banos while this is all the way here in Yosemite Valley in near Incline. So you can see how powerful the tracker gets what, while, when it's up in the sky. Uh, also if you go and switch the show last, so like track tail length to about 3 hours or so, you can get the full uh, length of your flight which you can see all the way over here with, which is uh, pretty cool. So the only thing that APLS.fi does not do is give you the final location of your balloon because there might not be enough stations nearby to pick up your uh, transmissions. But don't worry, there's uh, an app called APLS Droid which I'll be showing you um, a little bit in, in a couple moments. If you don't see your tracker on APLS.fi, don't worry. As we mentioned earlier, special stations called iGates pick up these transmissions and post them on the internet. The tracker isn't very powerful on the ground, so it may have some troubles getting its transmissions picked up by nearby iGates, but it gets much more powerful when it is up in the sky. To verify these transmissions, there's a very handy application called APLS Droid. Unfortunately, as of now, this app is only available on Android phones. Anyways, to use this app, all you need is a handheld radio, uh, a cheap one will do, this one's about 30 bucks, and an AFSK cable. Although buying a handheld radio may seem unnecessary, it's a great way to verify the transmissions of your uh, track we know, and as a licensed amateur radio, having a, track having a handheld radio is a great uh, tool to have as well. Uh, there are link in, there's links in the description uh, to where I got the handheld radio and the AFSK cable. So once you download the app, it costs around uh, 5 bucks, but it's very worth it, so I highly suggest you get it. So once you download, just click open, and it'll take you to this APRS Droid log. So when you first open up the app, uh, you have to go to settings and go to preferences. Let's click on that, and it'll take you to connection preferences, APRS connection, and go to connection protocol, and when you first 
open up the app, it will be on internet, APLS-IS, switch that to audio, AFSK. So this will allow you to plug in a cable from your handheld to your phone. So click on that. And then you can go back to uh, APLS Droid Log. And then when you're ready, click Start Tracking. Uh, when I begin, click when I click Start Tracking, plug in my handheld radio into my phone, you'll no longer be able to hear me. You'll only be able to hear the packets incoming. So just keep watching and you'll see KM6WSF-11 pop up and that is my tracker and that's the call sign I gave to it. So when that pops up, that indicates that your tracker is indeed transmitting and this is a great way to verify whether your tracker is transmitting or not. So let's do that right now. So not only does APLS Droid provide a verification if your tracker is working or not, it can it also provides GPS coordinates as well. So in our case, APLS.fi did not provide us the final location of the balloon, but fortunately APLS Droid did. And this is the final uh, transmission of the tracker uh, once it landed in Yosemite. So if you go to the top row of this packet, you can see 040510H. Beside that is a number 3739.27N and then slash 11948.86 West. So these are in fact co GPS coordinates in degrees minutes. So uh, all I did was go to Google Maps and put that in 3739.27N and 11948.86 West. Again, this is in degrees minutes mode. You can switch this to lat, lat long or degrees minutes seconds if you'd like. And once you pinpoint that, put that in Google Maps, it gives you the pinpointed location, which you can then use to chart a path to get your balloon, which is what we did. If your trackle still isn't working, don't worry, check your soldering. Make sure that each individual pin is separated. This will ensure that there are no unwanted electrical connections. We only want the connections that are printed on the circuit board. This will make sure that no component on the board is getting short circuited. As you can see right here, there's no pin getting unnecessary electrical contact. If that still doesn't work, don't worry. We felt the same way for about two weeks. I was thinking and thinking and thinking, but could not figure out what was wrong with the tracker. Fortunately, I contacted my local ham radio club and they were very happy to help. So local members, if you're watching this, huge shout out and thank you to you guys. This project would not have been possible without you. Anyways, what we discovered was the IC5 was actually short-circuiting the radio metrics, which is this thing. So what we did was we took out the IC5 and actually <clears throat> bridged this, this, and this. After doing so, the tracker worked great and we were able to verify this on APR's droid. You can also verify uh, the tracker electrically by placing, <clears throat> by placing a multi-ratio lead on radio metrics pin number four, which is a transmit enable, and one on the ground, which are one of these pins, which is denoted by the Arduino, as you can see, GND, ground. By placing the ground uh, lead from the multimeter onto this, or onto this track we know pin, so you can imagine it'd be placing it onto this one, and then placing a, the other lead onto Tracuino pin 4, which is a transmit enable, we can verify it electrically. Basically what you're looking for is every minute when the Tracuino transmits, there should be a jump in voltage indicating a transmission. And this jump in voltage should last about a second or so. So if you can see this, that means you can you verify that the Tracuino is indeed transmitting. So three ways to tra check if you're trying track we know is actually working, APLS.fi, APLS Droid, and electrically with a multimeter. Thank you for watching. I hope you learned something new in this tutorial. If you learned something that helped you make this tracker or helped you understand something that was going on, wrong, please uh, comment below. Also, if you enjoyed what you've seen, leave a like and subscribe. If you want to know how to make a good antenna that is much more powerful and bigger than this one, Stay tuned for that, so subscribe to see that video next. 
We'll also show you how to make your very own payload, which can resist very cold temperatures such as negative 60 degrees. So if you're interested in that, subscribe to see that upcoming video as well. So thank you for watching and I'll see you in the next video.